Good afternoon and welcome to the Second Chance Act orientation webinar for the fiscal year 2016 reentry program for adults with co-occurring substance use and mental disorders. Today we're going to hear from a bunch of different speakers. We have Andre Vesias, who's a policy advisor for corrections at the Bureau of Justice Assistance in the U.S. Department of Justice, and he oversees the Second Chance Act Co-Occurring Disorders Grant Program. We'll also have Donna Bond, who's the Coordinator of Mental Health and Reentry Services for Oklahoma Department of Corrections. She oversees the coordination between the Oklahoma Department of Corrections and the Oklahoma Department of Mental Health through various programs, one of which is a fiscal year 15 Second Chance Act Co-Occurring Disorders Program. So we're going to have her talk a little bit about her experience um, as a grantee, talk a little bit about completing the P&I Guide and what that process looked like for her jurisdiction, and um, give you some tips for things that she learned through the process over her first year as a, as a grantee in this grant cohort. We're also going to hear from Allison Upton, who's a Senior Policy Analyst in Behavioral Health at the Council of State Government Justice Center. And Allison is going to be the technical assistance and training provider to all of you on the line. So we know that you all have received emails and some of you have actually been able to speak to Allison on the phone already. If not, you'll be talking to her soon as part of the orientation process. The great thing about um, Allison is that she's been a practitioner of many years working in behavioral health and criminal justice cross-sectional cross programming. She's also a previous um, Department of Justice grantee, so she has the experience of being exactly where you are right now, which is always a good thing to have. And I am Sarah Wurzberg. I'm a grantee technical assistance manager for behavioral health at the Council of State Governments Justice Center. And as part of my job, I oversee the Second Chance Act Co-Occurring Disorders Program, as well as the Justice and Mental Health Collaboration Program for grantee technical assistance. So we're very excited to be here and talking, talking to you today. What this webinar is going to look like is we're going to do some introductions, just a little bit more about the Bureau of Justice Assistance, as well as the Council of State Governments Justice Center and the National Reentry Resource Center. We're also going to give an overview of the Co-Occurring Disorders Grant Program, some information on past grantees. Um, a unique thing that we're going to do this year is with there's five grantees in your in, in your cohort, so we're going to actually give space for each of the each of the program leads to introduce the program as well. And we'll talk a little bit about the Co-Occurring Disorders Planning and Implementation Guide. I'm sure you saw in the solicitation that that's part of the requirements um, of the grant program. So we'll walk you through the kind of topics that the P&I Guide will cover. Then, as I mentioned previously, Donna is going to talk about her experience as a fiscal year 15 grantee. And then we're going to open it up for questions and answers at the end. And if you have any questions or answers as we go as well, there's a chat box in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen, so you can feel free to chat in questions and we can um, either plug them in as it makes sense or, or hold them to the end to the question and answer session. So we're going to start with introductions, so I will hand it over to Andre. Good afternoon, my name is Andre Bethea and I am the Policy Advisor over the Second Chance Act Reentry Program for Adults with Co-Occurring Substance Use and Mental Disorders and the Policy Office at the Bureau of Justice Assistance better known as BJA. First of all, I want to congratulate on securing grant funding in an incredibly competitive year. Your applications were screened for basic minimum requirements, were reviewed, rated, and scored by panels of external peer reviewers, and after an internal review by BJA staff, you were recommended to the Assistant Attorney General for funding. So congratulations on your award. At BJA, our mission is to provide leadership and services in grant administration and criminal justice policy development to support local, state, and tribal justice strategies to achieve safer communities. The Second Chance Act has supported over 300 million in reentry services since it was passed in 2008. So just to give you a little bit of background about the Council of State Governments Justice Center, the Council of State Governments is a bipartisan policy solutions organization serving all three branches of government. 
in the Justice Center, we specifically work on criminal justice issues. The Justice Center has um, developed a bunch of different resources over the course of the past decade, including um, Adults with Behavioral Health Under Correctional Supervision, which is a shared framework that was a collaboration between multiple associations to really look at behavioral health and criminal justice and how the shared outcomes can be developed together. Um, we also have resources on other topics such as reentry employment, um, community supervision, law enforcement, and uh, school discipline, just to name a few. And then um, the Council of State Governments Justice Center is a Bureau of Justice Assistance grantee just like you, and we were awarded the contract for the National Reentry Resource Center. The National Reentry Resource Center was created in the passage of the Second Chance Act in 2008 and it's been launched by the Council of State Governments Justice Center in October 2009. Through this, we've provided technical assistance to over 600 juvenile and adult reentry grantees since the inception of the grant program. So we have a lot of other grantees we worked with, we've worked with previously within this grant program, and we feel that the peer connections that we're able to bring as a result are really important. This is to show you the National Reentry Resource Center webpage. All of those resources that you saw on that page and many, many more are up on our website. So we'd encourage you just to go and check it out if you're looking for resources on mentoring, for example, or on you know, evidence-based practices for substance use and mental disorder services, trauma-informed care. We have resources on all of those topics. We also have a National Reentry Resource Center newsletter, and that newsletter features different upcoming webinars, training events, um, grantee successes and highlights, so you want to hear about cool things other programs are doing around the country, as well as you know interviews with experts within the field. So we would encourage you to subscribe to that just to keep better, better abreast of what's going on in the rest of the country in reentry. So now I'm going to turn it over to Andre to give an overview of the Second Chance Act Co-Occurring Disorders Grant Program. Thanks, Sarah. To begin with, I will provide a bit of, of information of the history of the Second Chance Act Co-Occurring Disorders Grant Program. $37 million has been awarded to grantees over the past six years to state, county, and local, and tribal jurisdictions across the United States. Over half of the states have been awarded grants through this program. There have been 88 total awards through the Second Chance Act co-occurring disorders grant program. I will now turn it over to Allison Upton, who will be your grant program's technical assistance provider to help facilitate introductions. We are excited to learn more about your program. So good, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so this slide uh, actually is uh, a great list of the cohort of F uh, fiscal year 16 co-occurring disorders grantees. So we can see here who is in your group. Um, in the local county category, we have the County of Camden in New Jersey. We have the Criminal Justice Coordinating Council out of Toledo, Ohio. Uh, in the state category, we have the Mississippi Department of Mental Health represented and the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation. And in the Tribal Nation category, we have the Alaska Native, Native Justice Center located in Anchorage, Alaska. So we have a, a great cohort of grantees and I want to wish you all congratulations and I'd like to take a little bit of time for each of you to, <clears throat> excuse me, introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your initiative. So if each grantee could briefly please share uh, your, your name, your title, or your role in the project and then if there's more than one team member uh, present on the call, if you could ch have one of you speak about the name of the program who you're trying to serve, what your target population is, and some of the primary goals of the initiative. So why don't we start uh, first with the County of Camden in New Jersey. And uh, just a reminder also, pardon me before we start, is that uh, we're, we're going to open up the, the lines for everyone to take turns speaking, uh, but if you're not speaking, if you could please mute your phone line so we can avoid uh, some background noise until it's your turn to speak. So we'll start with County of Camden, New Jersey, please. Welcome. 
Hello, New well, Jersey, County of Kansas. Yes. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Glad you could join us. Thank you. So, why don't you share your your name and your role in the grant uh, in the grant initiative? Uh, my name is Marcia Smith, and I'm with the Gammon County Department of Corrections. I'm the program director for our Second Chance Program, which is our in-house drug and alcohol residential treatment program. With the grant, I'll be working as the uh, uh, program manager, along with of uh, my other colleagues, which um, which is Lieutenant Kareem. I don't know if he's signed in yet. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll be working with the day-to-day -day process with the reentry specialist with the inmates with co-occurring and substance abuse disorders. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And is uh, Sharon Bean on the line as well from New Jersey? Well, we're in different locations, so I'm, right. she's not in our office, so I'm not sure if she's listening in. Okay, okay. Um, could you just tell us the name of your of your initiative and who you're working with? What's your target population? Um, you mean the numbers? Uh, briefly, yes. Or who you're looking to work with. Uh, our current reentry project, and that's the name of it. And we call it Corp. E O. Mm -hmm. Excuse me, I'm I'm a little choked here for a minute. And um, we're going to be working with individuals who are county sentenced. And who have uh, go against both substance abuse and mental health disorder. Excellent. And they're all going to be coming out of the Camden County Correctional Facility. Is that that's correct? Yes. Excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you for your participation. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> and, now, and now, thank you so much. Congratulations. And now we'll move on to uh, the Criminal Justice Coordinating Council in Toledo, Ohio. Is there anyone on the call from Ohio today? Anyone from Ohio on the call? Come back to me, though. I'm trying to get my phone adjusted here. Oh, okay. We'll come back to you. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Is this Tom? It is Tom. Okay, we'll come back to you, Tom. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so next, we would like to reach out to Mississippi Department of Mental Health. Is Ann Rodeo on the on the able to hear on the call? Ann Rodeo or anyone from the Mississippi Department of Mental Health team? Thanks. I believe they were having some technical difficulties as well, audio difficulties, so we'll try to come back to them as well. If, if you want to talk um, to Lucas County, this okay. is Tom, we're, we're set now. Oh, okay, great. We'll go back to Tom and then we'll check in with Mississippi. So uh, from Toledo, Ohio, um, please uh, introduce yourself and tell us a bit about your program goals and your target population. Well, my, my, my name is uh, Tom Lutke. I'm the reentry coordinator for the Criminal Justice Coordinating Council here in Lucas County, Ohio. This is uh, actually our third Second Chance Act grant uh, that is active for our community. We have two other demonstration grants. This particular grant, um, we are targeting individuals coming out of our state prison system, um, Ohio Department of Corrections, that have stepped down to local halfway houses, of which we have two of those. Individuals coming out of those halfway houses will receive pre-release services by our case management provider task of Northwest Ohio prior to their release from the halfway house back into the community. Um, and, and it will be the case managers at the halfway houses that will identify who qualifies for the grant to ensure that we're getting the targeted population with co-occurring disorders. Um, 
The case managers will also introduce them to a mentoring component provided by the Youth Advocate Program. They have an adult life coach program that they, they're utilizing in, in New York. So we're going to use that model to provide folks in our grant with a mentor uh, pre-release to introduce them so they um, know who the individual is, they can build that trust level up. And then once the individual is released in the community, post-release, we will have <clears throat> educational and employment opportunities uh, provided through uh, an agency called Network. They operate our one-stop job shop, which is um, Ohio Means Jobs, and they will provide them with uh, educational resources, um, and they have um, a, a program specifically designed to work with individuals with co-occurring disorders. Uh, to, to line them up with educational resources or educate our employment opportunities. Um, a particular thing that I've wanted to start in our community here, and this grant's going to give us the impetus to do that, is implementing the SOAR Social Security uh, SAMHSA model of connecting folks that are disabled with Social Security benefits prior to their release from custody. So we, we've, two of us have been trained in that model and we are uh, hoping to bring some leveraged funds through our mental health board to to this um, grant to, to provide a dedicated caseworker that will focus on the SOAR model pre-release with individuals that are uh, truly disabled, hopefully connecting them with benefits that uh, they will start receiving upon their release that will lead to sustainable housing um, and, and, and reduced recidivism. Um, I think I'm missing one piece. I'm trying to think what that is. Is, is there some other parts of your question <laughs> that I didn't yeah, answer? That's, that's fantastic. That's great. Thank you so much. We appreciate that, okay. that sure. overview. Wonderful. Thank you. Sure. Uh, and now we're going to move on to Mississippi. Uh, we, uh, as far as we can tell, uh, the, point, the point of contact for that program who's Ann Rodeo. She's a social worker and she's the program administrator. She's having some, tech, some uh, audio difficulties. Ann, are you, have those been fixed? Can you hear us? Hi, Allison. I'm with you now. Oh, wonderful! So glad, glad that it's that it's resolved. We were just asking if br briefly if people. Well, I sort of introduced you because I wasn't sure if you could hear, but if you would please just tell us briefly about uh, the name of the of your of your program, who your target population is, and the goals that you hope to accomplish. Sure. Um, the name that we use is MS Corp. C O R P, just for Mississippi Co-occurring Reentry Program. Oh. You there? Just, just, yes, just a reminder for folks to please mute, mute your phones if you're not uh, speaking because of the background noise. Thank you so much. Okay. Go ahead, Ann. Oh, sure. And so our target population for the pilot program is going to be um, individuals who are released from custody from our three major institutional facilities, and that could be um, Parchman, SMCI, and CMCF, our three major facilities. Um, those people who are nonviolent offenders with co-occurring, identified co-occurring mental health disorders and substance use disorders who are returning to Hines County. And the reason we selected Hines County is because that, when we looked at the criteria and we ran a preliminary report, Hines County had the highest percentage of people that met our criteria for participation. In addition to that, Hines County also has a significant um, capacity for resources for recovery support and ongoing support for when people are released. So our objectives are, number one, obviously, to improve identification, and to that end, we already have the GAIN, Global Assessment of Individual Needs, short screener selected, and that's a co-occurring disorder screener. Um, Corrections has done a fantastic job of moving that contract through the process. We're already doing um, yeah. training and testing on that starting next week. Uh, they have a brand new recidivism risk tool that training has begun and we'll be looking at the results of that. Um, so with those two screeners, we'll identify our criteria and our candidate pool. Wonderful. So we're, we're pretty far along the way as it is. Um, and then our program itself is going to be, we already have a provider identified as Hines County Behavioral Health Services, and they're going to provide intensive outpatient services, which is 
to to accumulate the 300 hours of therapeutic time that's required by the grant, that'll probably be at least a six-month intensive outpatient program. What we're going to do Great. is we have a dedicated parole probation officer dedicated to this program, and we're either going to have the IOP service in the same building where the agent is located, or we're going to have the agent um, go over and visit Heinz Behavioral where the program will be facilitated. What we're trying to do is minimize every barrier that we possibly can to successful Wonderful. completion of the program. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Anne. We appreciate sure. that. Appreciate that so much in your participation. Um, and we'll move ne to the next grantee, uh, who's, the, who's the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation. Hello, California. Uh, and we just w would like to ask if you would brief briefly introduce yourself and just briefly tell us uh, about your target population and the goals of your program. Hi, this is Heidi Lozano. I am the point of contact for CDCR and our um, grant. In the room, we have Kendra Jensen. She will be our evaluator of the grant for the performance measures. And I have Ms. Lisa Hines, who is their um, clinical program administrator, who will be overseeing the field portion of it. And I'm going to hand it over to Lisa Hines to give more insight to the grant. Good Thank morning. You. Good morning. Thank you. Um, <laughs> so our grant is a second chance case management reentry pilot enhancement uh, program. And our target population will be inmates incarcerated in the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation with co-occurring mental health and substance use disorders. We have an assessment process that we're implementing uh, pre-release uh, with the ASAM assessment as well as our current risk and needs assessments, which is COMPASS as well as the CSRA score, which is our static risk assessment. We also uh, pre-release intend to provide each of our participants with uh, current Medi-Cal and SSI opportunities available in California, transitioning them to a phased case management program that will include three primary phases of care, uh, requiring the specific dosages of treatment hours with a clinical case manager who is also a licensed social worker as well as introducing new concepts to the enhancement, which will be using medicated-assisted treatment with our psychiatrists, uh, including a housing coordinator that will assist some of our more severely mentally ill parolees with uh, enhanced outpatient services as well as housing. And uh, we're attempting to imp implement a diversion process similar to the crisis intervention teams that we have out here where we identify the target population through our ID warrant system so that in the event local law enforcement happens to run into one of our participants in the field after hours, uh, rather than a parole agent assist, we can have them call our case managers and see if there's a diversion pre process prior to getting involved in uh, the criminal justice system over again. Wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And can you just tell us the five, I know that you're highlighting five particular counties. Can you just tell, tell the, uh, all the participants which five counties those are so that they're aware? Yeah, sure. It's Sacramento, uh, Kern, Los Angeles, San Francisco, in San Diego. Wonderful. Thank you so much for your participa participation today. And last but certainly not least, uh, I'll ask if anyone is on the call from the Alaska Native Justice Center. Okay, uh, I'm, I'm not sure that they were able to join. I don't believe they were able to join the call, but I'd like to tell you all a little bit about the program quickly. Uh, so, the, so you're aware, the Alaska Native Justice Center is based out of Anchorage, Alaska, and the point of contact there is Tamley Ashley. She's the Director of Program Operations. And so their project, which is called the Yageli 10 Good Trails Project, plans to serve 200 pre- and post-release adult male and female Alaska Native and American Indian offenders with co-occurring substance use and mental health disorders uh, that reside within the third judicial district in Anchorage. 
And although their target population is to work with uh, Alaska Native and American Indian individuals, they are going to be serving all participants that meet that eligibility criteria. But the reason, they noted that the reason why they chose that particular target population is that although um, Alaska Native and American Indians comprise only 15% of Alaska's total population, uh, they represent 36% of the adult incarcerated population. So that was a target area they wanted to look at. And they plan to build a stakeholder group and focusing on developing a culturally re relevant integrated system of care for pre and post release offenders. And so that's an update on their program. And so if you look at this next slide, thank you everyone for your participation and conversation. And if you look at this slide, this describes just an overview uh, and a reminder of the grantee orient process, orientation process. So uh, many of you listened to the original, the initial BJA Second Chance Act orientation webinar, which happened on Wednesday, November 9th. Um, and then of course today we are having the Second Chance Act uh, co-occurring uh, disorder grantee webinar today right now. And then all of you either have or will be participating in an orientation call uh, with your TA provider at the Justice Center, who is me, <laughs> Allison Upton. So uh, I know we have all those calls scheduled already. So look forward to those. And then I'll just briefly, as a reminder and overview for people, uh, because there are so many new names and contacts, wanted to, we wanted to give you a list of some of the important contacts that you will have as grantees. First of all, of course, is the Bureau of Justice Assistance, who is your funder and state policy advisor. And this is, uh, the, this is the place that you go to for all budget uh, and con contractual questions and for any grant adjustment notices. Next, of course, is the National Reentry Resource Center, which allows us at the Justice Center to provide you with training and technical assistance. And we are your contact person, uh, contact place for all monthly uh, technical assistance calls, for site visits and other resources. And then you also have CSR Incorporated, who is your contact for the performance measurement tool, uh, which is the data reporting that you do for your programming. And they have a help desk there. And now I'll turn it back over to Andre. Thanks, Allison. The Second Chance at Co-Occurring Disorders um, grant program's goal is to reduce recidivism and improve people's health outcomes through providing pre- and post-release co-occurring substance use and mental disorder services. This includes the use of a validated criminogenic risk and needs assessments and evidence-based substance use and mental disorder screening and assessment tools. To use these tools, these assessment tools, to develop comprehensive reentry case plans that are coordinated and collaborative uh, between corrections and behavioral health partners, the plans will include information on integrated treatment for co occurring substance use and mental disorders. Since each program was reviewed and selected based on criteria that uniquely qualified them as most competitive, I want to lay out some very specific expectations that we have of you. We expect that you will serve the number of people you propose within your application, that you will actively take measures to seek appropriate services for the targeted population or services designed to meet the needs of the population you serve, that you will use evidence-based risk and needs assessment instruments to accomplish this, that you will incorporate evidence-based trauma-informed co-occurring disorders, that you will seek help when help is needed and communicate regularly with your technical assistance coaches and BJA staff, including me, your program manager, and your policy advisor that will work with you on budget issues and grant adjustment notices. Next, I want to tell you a bit about us at the Bureau of Justice Assistance and the Office of Justice Programs. Also within BJA is the Programs Office. On the Second Chance Act general webinar, you heard from a few of the team members in the program's office who manages the individual awards that each of you have received. The program grant managers can answer all of your questions pertaining to allowable costs, management of the award, and reporting. We work closely together to ensure that all the Second Chance Act co-occurring disorder grantees remain on track with their awards. During the planning phase, which is typically between eight to 12 months, you will have access up to $50,000 of the total award 
to complete the planning and implementation, or as we call it, the P&I guide, and make sure your program is ready to move toward implementation. The P&I guides, as Sarah will talk through in further detail, are meant to help you effectively strategically plan for your grant program. The P&I guides will be submitted to BJA and reviewed in order your program to, in order for your program to move forward to the implementation phase and gain access to the remainder of your grant funds. The planning phase is something that has evolved over time as we identified the grantees need to make sure they have, found, have the foundations of their program in place prior to implementing the program. It is going to help you build capacity to implement your program effectively from the first day. It will help your team and partners identify strengths, areas that need improvement. You will receive targeted technical assistance from the National Reentry Resource Center through Allison. We look forward to the exchange of ideas that always come out of this process and providing opportunities for you to connect with your peers. The planning funds can be used for a variety of things to support your program. Meeting with stakeholders to continue the strategic planning, refining program design, and integrated care models. Identifying and preparing to implement screening and assessment, co-occurring disorder treatment services, access to health care, and other benefits. To make your program have, make sure your program has data collection strategy that can not only collect performance measurements tools, information, but help with your program sustainability. We want to ensure that after the award period, these programs continue to provide services to those in need in your community. Implementation funds will be used to support your programs through targeting people with high criminogenic risk and needs to be in your program in order to get the best recidivism reduction results. Enhancing intrinsic motivation of people in your programs through motivational interviewing, providing evidence-based and integrated treatment for substance use and mental disorders, making sure you are focusing on data collection. We want to make sure you are able to show your outcomes and track recidivism reduction. Many of you have research and evaluation partners, which is great. You want to make sure these people are involved and truly understand your programs and the clients you are serving. Provide effective reentry case plans and transition planning procedures. Case planning is a very important piece to the coordination between jail or prison staff, behavioral health providers, and community corrections. We want to make sure your teams are effectively coordinating to help increase the outcomes of the program participants. To mention this one more time, the data collection and performance measurement is a priority at BJA. We want programs to have the information they need to be able to continue after the end of the grant period and to get local support for the program. Now I would turn it back over to Sarah to further discuss the Second Chance Act Co-Occurring Disorders Planning and Implementation Guide. Great, thank you so much, Andre, for all that helpful information. So as he said, I'm gonna really focus on um, what NRC technical assistance looks like and the planning and implementation guide. The National Reentry Resource Center um, technical assistance involves several key priority areas, one of which is um, working with you on the planning and implementation guide, um, in identifying ways you can measure and track prog progress throughout the course of your grant period, including data collection strategies and providing resources, um, providing content and support on um, topics that are of need that come up in grant programs from things like risk needs responsivity to screening and assessment to sustainability. We also um, like to focus on how to share your successes. How are you making sure stakeholders, um, you have a champion in your jurisdiction, the field, and even press in your local community knows about the great work that you're going to be doing. Through technical assistance, this kind of is the easiest overlay that you'll see of what we are able to provide and what we love to do here at the NRC. We provide monthly technical assistance calls to all grantees, so you'll get to talk to Allison monthly, which will be fantastic. She'll really get to know your program, and you'll get to know her and get her expert advice. 
peer learning opportunities, which we mentioned a little bit previously. You know, we do have webinars, um, you know, such as this one to have you talk to your peers. We also have content webinars on topics like medication-assisted treatment, on information sharing across criminal justice and behavioral health, and other topics that are key priority areas for grant programs focused on co-occurring disorders. We have expert training, so there is um, there will be grantee training summits that will be coming up in the uh, spring or summer, and those will be um, available to you for your cohort to get together and hear from experts as well as meet everyone who is on the webinar in person, essentially. So you'll get to meet Andre and Allison, so we'll be excited to host you for those. Um, resource sharing, so I mentioned NRC's website, which has a lot of resources, but we know a lot of resources that exist outside of that, too. There are certainly other great organizations who have webinars, online trainings, and different resource guides that can be helpful to grantees, and really our goal is to connect you with any resources that you might need. And site visits, so we are able to do site visits for some grantees, and what a site visit looks like really depends on the jurisdiction's needs. You know, in one jurisdiction, we might really focus on stakeholder engagement and bringing together uh, a council, a reentry council, for them to meet and really focus on their program. In another jurisdiction, we might be focused on the reentry planning process and what those case plans really look like. Or in another jurisdiction, we might focus on data collection and sustainability. So it really depends on the needs of the site. So just some additional um, examples of technical assistance. And as I said, it really is individualized. So, you know, we might do gender responsive services training for working with women, for those of you who are working with that population. We like to help, um, we develop a lot of resources too to translate different research concepts into practice. That's really the focus of our organization and our technical assistance. So a lot of people who work um, on the ground level at the program don't have time to sit around reading research studies. So that's part of what we bring to you is trying to translate that information and provide it to you in a digestible way that's actually usable so you can implement the priorities of your grant program. Now to talk a little bit about the P&I guide. So the planning, the planning phase of your grant is really the P&I guide phase of your grant. We um, look forward to working with you on completing um, the P&I guide. Just a couple of tips on that is the really the best, the best way that we find to do this is for you to be able to have honest conversations with a whole group of stakeholders who will be involved in implementation of your grant to make sure that every stakeholder is getting and every partner is getting what they need out of the design for the program. Um, we want you to keep your answers brief but specific and really um, get to the heart of what you're trying to talk about, whether it is you know, stakeholder engagement or it's accessing healthcare coverage and connecting people to benefits. You'll, um, typically the process will be that you'll fill out um, an exercise prior to the NRC monthly call and then you'll send it to um, Allison, you know, a week or more prior to that call and you, you will go over with her what the content in that. So it really helps flag any issues that you might be having on these topics which you'll flag through, through the process with your group, but also through discussions with grantees, she might say, oh, well, I know a program who did this and that was really helpful and things along those lines. So she'll, well, you'll be able to discuss it and then you can update the exercises. One important piece that I always like to add is that the planning and implementation guide is completed during the planning phase, but we actually come back to it throughout the course of technical assistance. So if you're thinking about making changes to something, we'll go back to that section in the P&I guide and help you to update that. So it's really a living, breathing document, so you have a whole layout of what your program looks like. So these are, these are not just used during that phase. So what are other ways in which we use the P&I guide? Well, we identify things that grantees are doing well and things that grantees might be struggling with. And it might turn out that a bunch of grantees are struggling with the same thing. Maybe um, selecting a screening tool for substance use disorders in it is an issue for three or four grantees. So that gives us the opportunity to provide technical assistance to multiple jurisdictions on similar topics and to connect you with your peers who may have actually figured it out. It helps us target 
technical assistance for the future. So through these conversations, we might realize that, you know, an area in need for your jurisdiction is really thinking through um, how to attract engagement and retention within your programs. And so that's something that we will flag and intend to focus on for um, the next year of technical assistance. It also helps us to create those peer-to-peer -peer learning opportunities and um, really is just a way to exchange ideas and best practices and we at the National Reentry Resource Center in addition to Allison have other expert staff that we're able to pull in as well as consultants to help with when, when it gets really granular specific issues. The planning and implementation guide sections <coughs> for this grant program, there are six sections and I'm going to go over each of them in a bit of detail right now. And, but the piece that on this slide that I want to point out is actually the supporting resources. So at the back of the guide, there's an appendix and it has a resources on each of these topics. So if you get to a section and you're like, wow, I really just don't know how to answer this, we would remind you just to look at the appendix and see if any of those are helpful. So you're trying to pick a criminogenic risk assessment tools. There's actually a guide in the back that helps you select tools. So that is possible and you can always also reach out to Alex. Hello, welcome back. For some reason, my phone completely um, cut out there for a second, so I sincerely apologize and thank you for hanging with us. Um, I was just starting to go over the different sections of the planning and implementation guide. We appreciate your patience. So in addition to the background information, we also talk about the collaborative work group. So what stakeholders and partners are around the table in order to help you implement this grant initiative? And how are you talking about your program to other stakeholders in the community? How are you making sure that they're engaged and kept up to date throughout the course of this process? Section two and three. Section two is really about focusing in on your target population. Well, there may be a specific target population that was written into the grant, sometimes there's a lot of refining that needs to ha happen on how you actually identify the correct target population within your correctional institution. And so we often see grantees having some barriers to really getting to their correct target population. We also go through the screening and assessment process for you. What would it look like for someone going through this program? As well as connections to healthcare benefits and a and, and other benefits such as veterans benefits, SSI, SSDI, food stamps, and other options available in your community. For section three, we actually go through and lay out with you the specific pre and post release services that you're offering from you know, case management services to some evidence-based practices you might be providing such as seeking safety for one example. In section four, we talk about assessing the transition process. So Second Chance Act, as you know, is reentry grants. So this is really this is really where the rubber hits the world road here. The um, the transition process includes the case manages, the connection to community based providers, community supervision strategies and evidence based practices. And then section five, we talk about data collection, performance measurement, and program evaluation. So we look at what you're actually, what you're actually providing um, within these different do domains. So how can you go from performance measurement, what's your data collection practices, and then what is your program evaluation going to look like as a result of all of these things? 
Section six is focused on sustainability and really cr trying to create an action plan for sustainability. It is never too early to start thinking about sustainability because we want to make sure all of the good work that you'll develop over the next three years is able to be sustained in your community as a resource for the people who really need it. After the planning and implementation guide is complete, Completed, you'll submit it to the Bureau of Justice Assistance. They'll review it, and then you'll get your implementation funds. <clears throat> and as I said, the guide will be continuing to be used to guide the conversation. Now we're actually going to give it to Donna Bond to talk about her grantee experience. Take it away, Donna. Okay. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you well. Thank you, Donna. Great. Okay, um, first I just want to congratulate um, each of you that um, have received these awards. Uh, the work that we do is so important and so critical, and this grant is just a wonderful opportunity, uh, at least it is for our uh, group here in Oklahoma. In reference to the program implementation guide, I can definitely say without hesitation that the, this pre-funding requirement during the planning phase of the award period has been the best multifaceted tool that our group has. Um, I have been involved with the management of a few other federal grants in uh, my career, and um, this process of doing a pre-program, uh, a program implementation guide was not included in those grants. Um, looking back after doing this guide and starting with uh, working with this grant, I can just see countless the numerous ways with those grants that this guide would have been so helpful. Um, you know, I, I really think that um, it, it just takes a lot of time and a lot of effort from having to search back through different research and different, you know, your grant application and um, all of the attachments because this is just your perfect reference for anything that comes up. Um, one very effective use of this tool is that if you have someone that comes in that was not involved um, in the front end of writing the grant or planning the grant, um, maybe, for example, with Oklahoma, um, when the grant was awarded, uh, there was um, an open position for a grant management specialist staff. So uh, this new position was hired, uh, Jack Hunter was hired uh, within weeks of us starting this guide. So she was new to DOC, Department of Corrections, and she was new to this grant. But she was in on the on the calls with Mark Stovall um, in getting this guide put together, and um, it really helped bring her up to speed about what the grant was for, what you know, who our target population is, just everything that's in that application, but more. I mean, I look at it as everything in the application narrowed down to include like the research that you use to get there. It's just, you know, and it's in sections. So you can go to the section that you're wanting to learn more about or that you have questions with, and it's just put together very, very well. Um, for our particular group with our grant, um, the group that did the guide was the um, lead research and about program evaluator. Um, uh, Dr. David McLeod and myself, as well as the new grant specialist. And then we had um, the supervisor of the community-based team that worked with our inmates or our population once they got out of prison. Uh, he was also on the call. So we had a relatively small group that did the guide and working on, you know, to work on the guide. Um, but we made sure that there was a representative of kind of each component or each phase of the grant uh, involved in completing the guide. And, you know, the technical assistance and the, the calls that we had with Mark um, were very, very helpful. He was really flexible in that, you know, if, if we could get quite a bit done within a week's time, then we would do a call weekly. Um, and, you know, that's kind of what we did with ours, but, you know, he said, 
uh, at the beginning if we needed to do a call every two weeks. It was kind of, you know, worked at whatever pace that we could work at, but we wanted to get it done as quick as possible, and he was always available for us, and that was, that was very helpful. Um, you know, we would have the content um, in the sections that he had told us to, to start on, and we would go through those, and, you know, either uh, he would think that, you know, those were adequate, or he would bring up questions or scenarios or, well, you know, did you look at this, or what do you think about that, and just try to elicit more thought out of us um, into going ahead and making that, those questions or that um, number or section even better. Um, and then, um, in the past, when I've been uh, managing grants, for the very first startup meeting, this is a meeting that everyone involved in the grant from finance to um, the community-based team to uh, any case managers that may be, you know, working with the team. Um, and we collaborate a lot with the Department of Mental Health and Substance Abuse Services. Uh, we've had a collaboration with them for the past 10 years on the uh, reentry programs for substance abuse and mental health. Um, and so, we invite that group. So it's a pretty large meeting for the startup. Um, and historically, I've always created a PowerPoint that just covers all the main points of the grant and then gives, you know, room to ask questions and discussion. So I started creating a PowerPoint, uh, PowerPoint for this grant, and then it occurred to me, you know, I already have one. We have the perfect PowerPoint. So I used that for the startup meeting and I also made a hard copy for everybody who came to the meeting to take with them for reference. And, you know, we had a lot of feedback and saying that this guide was very helpful, that um, it really gets into the details, um, you know, just kind of cuts right through to, you know, the information you're looking for, where a grant application, when you look through that for information, a lot of times you kind of have to look through, um, well, this research shows this and, you know, the tables and, and a lot of things that, you know, maybe not exactly what you're looking for, where with the guide, it's more direct and you're going to be able to find those answers um, to your questions. So, we use that for that reason, and it's, it's worked out well. Um, and let's see, it seems like I had one more point to make about this. Oh, uh, so kind of the last point I have, the last really positive that I, I find with the, the um, guide is when we started working on this guide, there were only two of us in our small group that had already established a, a working relationship. Um, our grants management specialist was new. Um, I was not uh, familiar with our uh, research and um, program evaluator. Uh, so, you know, we were all kind of new to one another. But working through this process, really brought us to be like a more cohesive group um, where we are all on, you know, like speed dial type basis now. Um, it just it just brought us closer together as a group. Um, you know, each section, even though we kind of took our individual sections that would relate best to what our functions are in the grant, we still went through each section, each question, each point together. Um, so, you know, when you go through a process like that, you're going to get to know each other. We did most of our uh, by conference call and kind of through email. However, we did come together at the very first um, before we actually started uh, doing it, we came together and talked about it and kind of decided how we would do it. And then, um, um, again, at the startup meeting, you know, we came back together. But in between times, um, we, because we're all scattered out throughout the state of Oklahoma, um, well, most of them are in Oklahoma City, and I'm not, so I guess I'm, I'm the one that's scattered. 
but um, we get a lot through email and through phone calls and conference calls. And Mark, again, can't, cannot say enough about um, how helpful he was, and I know you guys are going to have um, Allison, if I understand correctly, will be um, you guys with Mark, where <laughs> ours was Mark. But um, I know that she will be just as helpful and, you know, available for you guys as well. And if there's anything I can ever do um, to help with any of you five recipients, I would be glad to. I guess that's all I have to say. Oh, great. Thanks so much, Donna. And we're going to actually open up to questions. Um, from the grantees on the line. So um, your lines are gonna be open. So if you have a question, feel free to speak up. And there's also a chat box that you can um, chat in your question and then we'll read it out to answer. So if you have any questions, um, please ask. Um, hi, this is um, Arsha from New Jersey. Can you hear hi. me? Hi. Yeah, I can. Hi, Marsha. Hi, um, I'm from the Camden County Department of Corrections, and uh, the P&I guide that we're developing, the, uh, are there any samples that would be available? Examples of grantees who have previously completed the guide? Yeah, it, uh, would there be any of those? Sure. Made? Oh, that would be yeah. great. Yeah, we can send you some examples. And there's some slight alterations um, that have been made to the new guide. We just do little tweaks every year to make sure it's updated for folks. But we certainly can provide, um, provide some examples. And maybe if Donna is actually okay with it, we could potentially provide her guide since you've already heard a little bit about her program. Hi. <laughs> I have no problem with that whatsoever. Oh, thanks, thanks, Donna. Hi, this is Sharon. Can you hear me? Yeah, hi, Sharon. Hi. When will we expect to receive the guide? So I know we'll get an example, and thank you, Donna, for sharing, but when will we actually get the updated one that we'll be expected to complete? So we would anticipate um, uh, you'll receiving the guide in um, December, probably. Um, we're okay. making the final final updates to that, and also we like to try to not overwhelm people as they start going through so many steps for the orientation process. Okay, great. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi, Donna. Yes. Hi, this is Ann from Department of Mental Health in Mississippi. Yes. Um, greatly appreciate you being willing to take the time to to share your experience with us. How um, oh, is My one question is, um, it's more general. As you were going through and okay. music here, you there? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, as you were going through, and when you, you know, initially submitted your grant application and you had your your proposed program in place, and then you were going yes. to the CNI guide, and then it's day one and you're in implementation mode. What's the yes. biggest thing that you can think of that you learned along the way where you had to either redirect uh, resources or change the program? What was the biggest <laughs> pickup or barrier that you discovered that you never considered day one? Okay, I can. I think I can answer that. Pretty, I think I can give you a good good answer for that. Um, first of all, um, I came in, I started work with the Department of Corrections. I had been working with the Oklahoma Department of Mental Health for about nine years before I changed to the Department of Corrections. Okay. Um, so I came in after the grant had been awarded, and so I kind of had a little catch-up to do anyway, but not much. <clears throat> and I did this same kind of work with the Department of Mental Health, and I was already working with the Department of Corrections and all of that. So I actually um, had the lead in writing this proposal, but mm -hmm. I worked closely with the man who did. And I had concerns from the beginning that 
the number of facilities and the facilities that he had um, identified as being the facilities we would um, uh, um, get our participants from may not be enough to actually meet the proposed number. Okay. Uh, so the very first thing that I talked to, um, obviously, my supervisor and the new grants management and her supervisor and, you know, obviously went through our chain of command in asking their approval to put in a, uh, a GAN, which is a grant adjustment notice, I believe, um, asked in that to expand um, to actually three more locations. Um, expanding, and, and I'm very familiar with the different facilities and um, kind of the population and where, you know, the best site that identifies the, the most uh, people with co-occurring um, needs. So I was able to, you know, with collaboration from the group, come up with some other locations to propose, and we were actually able to get that approved through, um, uh, through the grant <coughs> administrator, and that was the first thing. Um, and it took about from the, the time that we, you know, that we asked a permission to do that to expand to the time we got permission was about two weeks, I would say, maybe a little bit over two weeks. Okay. I think that's the best example I can think of right now. Do you have anything more specific? Are you, do you have something specific in mind? No, actually that's the thing is, you know, being that this is the first Second Chance Act that um, we've had here in Mississippi with mm -hmm. either Department of Corrections and or Department of yes. Health taking the lead. Yes. I think our um, DHS department has had one for a juvenile grant in the past, yes. uh -huh. but this is the first one. And so my biggest question is, what is it that we don't even know? And that's actually a wonderful example. <clears throat> well, and I will tell you that from my experience, and I think the group that I've worked with, um, the group that I work, do work with with this, would agree that that's something that the guide is very helpful in doing, and you will see as you're working through it, it helps you identify potential gaps or potential issues that you mm -hmm. don't even know that you have. Mm -hmm. um, and that, I, I think that's one of the best things about it. Um, you know, we already felt like that we were going to need some, you know, some more participants, you know, a greater number to pull from, and, and therefore we were going to need to expand. We, we already knew that, basically, but, um, Still, as we went through the guide, there were just there were things that came up that I didn't think of before we got to the guide. You know, so you you definitely learn from it, um, and and it's very very possible that things will come up during the guide that may um, prompt you to want to do something to you know uh, to propose again or to propose uh, some little change here or there that will. Um, you know, enhance and improve your program. Okay. Well, I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. So I realize that we are now at the 3 o'clock mark, which is when we said we would be completing the webinar. Um, but if you have any additional questions, please feel fr feel free to call, uh, communicate with Allison or myself. Um, or it sounds like Donna's also open if you have any specific questions for her, but the National Reentry Resource Center and the Bureau of Justice Assistance, again, want to congratulate you on the awards and say how we are excited we are to be working with you over the course of the next three years. So we look forward to future communications and to being able to meet you in person in the spring or summer. Have a great day. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Are you going to call me a second? Yeah. Wait, we're doing a webinar. Yeah. 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 yeah.